The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on Gen XYZ and we'll be talking about contemporary issues or topics based on the youth. But now today on the show we'll be talking about a topic that basically affects everyone. Now Sri Lanka's economic crisis is there for everyone to see which started off as an acute economic crisis and now has turned into a political crisis and therefore into a social crisis. You can see now that one million people have gone into poverty. There are huge queues for petrol, gas and diesel. There are constant power cuts. We have a shortage of food and medical supplies. Even doctors are warning that the number of deaths could be more than the deaths we experienced in the COVID pandemic due to the economic crisis and due to the shortage of medical supplies. So because of that, I feel that this topic is not going to die off anytime soon. And to discuss this issue, we have uh, both Mathura, Economic Research Analyst at Econsult Asia, and also Shirani Lamperuma, the Chief Editor of Businomics Magazine. And these two are not new faces on the show. They have been with us previously as well. And it's my pleasure to have both of you all again. Thank you very much for taking the time to join me today. Thanks for having us back. So both and Shiran, um, to start off this discussion in the first place, where do you think Sri Lanka went wrong in the first place? Uh, what was the issue that we had and do you think that we can rectify this mistake? Do you mean uh, where we went wrong in, in the recent past or going back historically because that could be a very big question. <laughs> Let's go back to the history. Yeah. And start off from there. Um, well, I think uh, we covered a little bit of this before the last time we spoke. So, yes. you know, there are structural weaknesses in Sri Lanka's economy, going back to even colonial times and the basic structure of the economy that Sri Lanka inherited from the British, right? So, we were a plantation economy. We produced a few agricultural products, uh, coconut, um, rubber, tea, of course, being the main one. And uh, that's what we were doing. We were basically uh, exporting plantation products, uh, not value added, just raw materials and we were importing all sorts of uh, manufactured goodies at within our capabilities. Um, so over time that really didn't change very much. We never went into manufacturing, we never industrialized. So we had this structural problem where we were producing cheap non-value added things and we were importing very expensive things. Um, that produces uh, a trade deficit, right? And we've had this trade deficit quite consistently, um, especially since uh, 1977. It's just been growing and growing and growing. Um, and so, you know, how are we paying for these things? We pay by borrowing money, right? So, of course, we have a debt crisis. Both, um, what do you have to say so about that? So, just to add on to what Shiran said, he caught the trade deficit, right? Trade deficit, external deficit. So, building up on that, the crisis we see on the roads, the queues that we see are bas basically because we don't have do enough dollars to import these goods. So basically we have a cash flow management problem, a specifically a dollar cash flow management problem. We have more dollars going out than dollars coming in. And with the start of COVID, we got the tourism flow that was completely dried down. So that was about net three to $2 billion yearly that we lost. And we didn't really have anything to match that uh, up, a new inflow. And then we did cut uh, expo uh, import of cars. There was about one billion a year that we cut. But still, there was a deficit, right? We already had a massive deficit. And then COVID made sure that we lost one of our main inflows. And moving into 2021, we got remittances also dropping. So 2021, at the end, we were losing on remittances. And in 2020, we are still, I think, about 80 to 50 percent in between remittances are lower than it, what it used to be, right? So now we need to increase our inflows or reduce our outflows to uh, address this crisis. That's basically when right. considering the recent past, if I'm not mistaken, according to research, we were an upper middle income country, but right after the pandemic, we again went 
drast we dropped drastically low. And was there a specific reason for that? Is it solely because of the COVID-19 pandemic? I wouldn't think so. I think we were already in a downward trend. So uh, basically, upper mil middle income country, you become one when your uh, GDP per capita reaches a certain level. So when our population is constantly growing at maybe uh, 0.8 to 1% annually, and our GDP has to grow uh, at a rate higher and also uh, not depreciate at a rate lower than that. So it's a multiple number of things happening, and our GDP growth is slowing. So by 2019, we were slowing to 2.3%. And then COVID, uh, with that decline, it just put, put us under. So I think we were already slowing down, and COVID just pushed us over. Right. Now, if I'm not mistaken, like everybody is trying to find solutions, just coming from the citizens to businessmen to even political leaders, everybody wants to find out an answer for this economic crisis because everybody is suffering from this. But when considering our country as a whole, where do you think which income level is affected the most? I think certainly um, the you know the, the lowest income level, the poorest of the poor, are uh, affected the most. You know because um, especially with the increases in the price of fuel uh, and food, you know these are very basic necessities. If you, if you go through the household uh, income and expenditure surveys, right, the the lowest uh, seg lowest income segments of Sri Lanka, uh, they spend the highest amount of their daily income on these essential goods. So when the prices of these goods increase, um, it's their income that's being eaten into. Whereas, of course, it's difficult for the middle class um, as well. But you know, the, the middle class also has a level of uh, expenditure that is just you know for fun, for trips, uh, you know, to to buy nice things as you know for for their children or for themselves. You know, there's there's some level of consumption there. So for them, the pain is okay. You you can't uh, have that level of consumption. You can't go out for that drink or for that trip or that party but for the for the lowest level of society it's you know it's it's uh, it's a very difficult situation it's, um, it's life or death yeah they just don't have that cushion right yeah, to fall yeah. into right and now everybody is unsure about what will happen in the near future as well it doesn't have to be 10 to 12 years later from all what's going to happen next month where do you think we would be in the next three months. Do you really think that according to the UN or the people warning Sri Lanka that we would be going into a famine? Mm. That's, uh, I think that's a hard thing to address uh, directly, but I think as of now, uh, India has given us a credit line which is allowing us to import the essential food, fuel, gas, everything, even the fertilizer that we need so far. But uh, right now, as of now, we don't have another credit line for the next three to six months. So last three to six months, we got a two billion, close to three billion total credit line from India. And we need another two to three billion for the next six months to import what we need essentially. So as of now, we don't have anything lined up. And I haven't heard of anything yeah. that is lined up. So. I mean, that's the first thing that needs to be addressed that comes to my mind. Definitely. I, I mean, I don't want to be alarmist and say there's going to be a famine. But at the same time, of course, you can't sugarcoat it. So the global situation is also really, really bad. And it's, it's getting worse, especially in, in Europe and the US. They're heading towards a recession there. Um, there is talk by some analysts that the price of oil is going to increase again and probably hit 150 a barrel once the Chinese economy opens up from, you know, they've had um, extended lockdowns in areas like Shenzhen. So once the, the Chinese economy opens up, the price of oil is going to go up again, and that's going to affect us very badly. Uh, that's going to affect the price of food, um, the price of fertilizer. Uh, so those are all serious concerns. Uh, lately, we've seen, despite floating the rupee, the uh, amount of remittances haven't increased. So there's a lot of speculation that perhaps that this is going through the black market, through Undil. And certainly, I think a portion of that is in the black market. But we also have to uh, face the fact that we might actually have a lower stock of external migrants who are sending remittances, right? Because um, after the, the pandemic hit, a lot of people came back from the Middle East. Uh, so we have no way of evaluating what our stock of migrants is, uh, at least no official data. So that could have uh, run out. Another thing is tourism, right? That was one of our main um, foreign currency inflows. Um, I'm not sure that tourism is going to recover uh, this year because if you see again 
the levels of inflation even in the West, right? The household savings levels in G Germany, Netherlands, or uh, Russia, or the US, it's, it's all going down. So even the middle class in those countries, they're probably not uh, thinking of a trip to uh, you know, a tropical paradise. They're also trying to survive now. That's true. Yeah. I think both, uh, you mentioned now, we have a credit line from India as yeah. well, and you told that they are supplying fertilizer for us as well. Do you think the decision that the government made some time ago to ban fertilizer was a good idea at that time? I think the movement towards organic, I'm completely for a movement towards organic food, but I think there's a way, certain way of doing it. Right. You can't wake up one day and be like, I'm going to ban something. It should have been laid out in a more structured manner, maybe tested out in a certain crop group or in a certain area, certain city maybe. You know, try it out, okay, how much is it initially going to drop and how much will it increase in later on? Mm -hmm. So I think it should be more structured and it definitely did not help with the external crisis that we were already having of our dollar inflows and outflows mismanagement, right? So we need it for TTs, a two, three billion, uh, close to three billion dollars export. And if that harvest gets uh, affected, that's directly going to just reduce another inflow. As well as if we now need to uh, import more food, agriculture products, that's also not helping us right now. So maybe a good idea, a good thing to go for, but not the best time to do it, and not the best way to do it. Shiran, to add on to that, what do yeah. you think we should do right now? for this uh, problem? Right now, I think there needs to be a, v a massive intervention in the agricultural sector. Basically, anything and everything has to be done um, from basically pr from whether it's promoting uh, home gardening, uh, the agricultural department, I think, needs to go into overdrive and do you know, a massive uh, food cultivation campaign, uh, distribute seeds uh, in urban areas, uh, suburban areas as well, and sort of uh, you know, tell people what you can grow in your garden. Um, you know, it, it doesn't mean that everyone can have a massive crop in their garden, but every little bit actually counts. And um, you know, these things have been experimented with in a, in uh, a lot of countries. Even in Vietnam, there are community gardens in uh, in urban areas. So these are things we have to uh, to look at. Uh, distribution systems are also very important. We've always had problems with middlemen, and I think now is a uh, probably the best time ever to try and get rid of that to ensure the cultivators get a decent price and the consumers also get a decent price. So to have some sort of mechanisms to distribute food, especially essentials, to the people who need it the most. And now foreign reserves play a critical role here. And we being an import-driven market also, it's, it's not helping that our reserves are depleting. Um, what do you think, like, where do you think that we went wrong in depleting our reserves? Now, before the COVID pandemic, we had all our reserves secured, but also if we take Bangladesh, during the COVID pandemic also, they were able to restore their foreign reserves. Why do you think that Sri Lanka was not able to do so? It's important to know that even though uh, before COVID, like in 2019, also we had a massive, I think, close to 7 billion, if I'm not mistaken, reserve, but partly part of that was also borrowed. So how reserves are built up is that if any inflow that comes in, uh, is we have more inflows coming in than what goes out, and there's a certain that amount is kept in as the reserves. So we have FDIs uh, and also government borrowings, right? So every year when the government borrows more than it pays back in dollars, that amount will go to the reserves and they'll take rupees for their own fina budgetary financing acts. So even though we had a reserve, it, you could call it a borrowed reserve. It's like you took out a loan and kept it in your bank account mm -hmm. and thought it was a savings. But ideally, you have to pay it at back at some point. Yeah. That's because we have a trade deficit, right? We need more dollars to finance this economy than we produce right, within the country. So where we went wrong, I would say, is, I wouldn't say we went wrong. I don't think you can just subjectify that like that. But we started paying back our loans and not borrowing as much. So the government in 2020 and 2021 completely had a, a domestic financing method of the budget. So they, we printed the money and financed it, or we tax it and finance it, but we didn't take uh, foreign loans, or we didn't take it as much as we used to. So I think, I personally think that we should have maybe gone for more foreign loans in 2020 and 2021, so that maybe we would have had that uh, loans, but I don't 
believe that that's a sustainable way to go forward as a country because you can't just be on borrowed reserves, right? Shiran, would you like to yeah, add? Yeah, very to much. That? I think I'm both uh, nailed it. Basically, that's uh, as he said. The you know the reserves that we perceived to have had were always kind of illusory. I mean, if you're a country with a persistent trade deficit, how can you speak of having reserves unless you're you're borrowing it from somewhere, right? Um, the only thing that changed is our credit rating was downgraded, uh, so we were not able to get um, you know debt from the market. We were not able to borrow more. Um, so then, you know, one could argue that we should have run our policy in such a way to not get uh, downgraded. But then, of course, there are severe limitations to that as well, because to to move Sri Lanka into a sort of a productive, export-oriented footing, to move into industrialization, you need to enact certain pol policies that kind of go against the norm. There has to be a certain amount of uh, intervention. Um, you know, un unfortunately, I think Sri Lanka was caught in the perfect storm. Um, made made a couple of mistakes and tried to do things at the wrong time. <laughs> All right. Before we continue with our discussion further, we'll have to go into short commercial break. We'll be back soon. You're watching Gen X Y Z. Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we are in discussion with both Mathura and Shiran Ilamperuma and in the first segment I think we discussed about the current situation we are facing uh, in Sri Lanka the, about the economic crisis and I would like to continue this discussion again. Now just before the break we were talking about foreign reserves and I feel one of the solutions that our country has come up with was that people working abroad were requested to send their money that they earned into Sri Lanka via legal bank transfers because then they can keep track about uh, the dollars which are coming into our country but there's a certain amount of mistrust that our people have in this because they feel that their dollars might be misused again or probably would have been stolen for other reasons and not put into the development of our country as well do you think that this is possible to happen like for our country to steal the dollars coming in from abroad if so if they transfer their funds into our country, what are the benefits that our country can obtain from this? I think that question simply has a no for the first question. Your money cannot be stolen if it's transferred through the banking system. You're basically sending it from one place to your own bank account in a local bank, unless, of course, there's a bank heist, which is highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. So other than for that, your money is safe, your dollars are safe, and the benefit of that is you will directly be responsible for reducing the queues, right? So uh, the importers who want to buy essential food items, ass uh, essential medicines, gas, fuel, CPC fuel, everyone who wants to open a letter of credit or needs dollars to import, go to the bank and they ask for dollars. So now the banks have less dollars because a certain amount of people are not putting their norm normal salaries, in the dollar salaries into these banks. So if you they do end up coming through the banks, the banks will be able to give out more letters of credit or pay, give more dollars for importers to import these goods. So I think it's a good thing if everyone could send it through the legal way because that will genuinely help all these queue problems and for the food and medicine that people really need. You know. Shiran, uh, what are the other benefits you think that our country will be able to obtain? Um, well, I think both uh, covered it, but you know, the, with the remittances, trying to get it back to the previous level is basically like trying to go back to the status quo, I feel, right? Which, of course, the, the status quo before 2020 uh, was better than it is now, but it, it was that situation that led us here to begin with, right? The, the dependence on uh, remittances, the dependence on uh, tourism, the lack of a production economy. So s certainly in, in the short term, it's, it's good to bring the remittances back up to get the dollar inflows, as both said, to reduce the queues so that importers have access to dollars to import the essentials that we need. Um, but you know, in, the, in the longer term, you also have to think that w with remittances, one of the problems with remittances, even though we count it as a foreign currency inflow, is that a lot of it is spent in consumption, right? So you know, uh, lots of families across Sri Lanka, they've been 
receiving you know remittances for a long time even some parts of my family receive uh, remittances or send remittances from overseas and you know the thing is you notice that there's not a drastic change in the quality of life of these people because you know, the money comes in and then it flows back out as imports right so what sri lanka needs to de to develop is not just consumption but investment so we need we need uh, foreign currency to actually invest in infrastructure in in production in capital goods um so i think you know go going forward it's not just about getting the remittances back up but it's also about the government trying to think about what to do with these dollars like i mean do we do we want the dollars to continually flow out as uh, you know as imports as consumption or do we need to find ways to productively invest these uh, these dollars into something that can sustain sri lanka into the future so we don't fall into another crisis like we are in today do you think our country is in the right track now to take these decisions that's a difficult one to answer uh i guess the honest answer is probably no simply because the the political scene is a little bit chaotic right now um you know there's a lot of uncertainty i think among the among the public and you know daily things are ch changing in the political arena so without some semblance of political stability and also without a degree of national unity i guess we can't come to a point where there's broad agreement on you know one consensus one like general de development agenda for sri lanka like what are we going to do to get out of it um that said i i think in a way a crisis like this is good because it will you know teach people a lesson so to speak that you know we'll hopefully learn from the mistakes that we've made and come together to you know realize that you know we need to move forward into industrialization into um export oriented industrialization and manufacturing so hopefully you know that comes out of this crisis and the current chaos all right now coming back to international funds again i think china was one of the main partners uh, like prior to this economic crisis but we've seen a little bit backlash between china and sri lanka these few days because china has been silent for some time and now india has stepped up in uh, helping sri lanka so do you think uh, china being silent will be hindering the relationship in future um i don't think it will hinder the relationship in future um i think sri lanka's you know sri lanka obviously has a very uh, long and strong relationship with china um and you could say things were a little bit turbulent in the last uh, few years where there were some contracts that were changed uh, there were some trade disputes with the um with the fertilizer uh, and then of course there was a statement by uh, the chinese embassy alleging that they had offered sri lanka um a path alternative to going to a default and going to the imf and that uh, sri lanka had chosen the path of a default that was um, what the chinese ambassador had said at the time um right now uh yes it's true that india has uh, stepped up to help a lot but i think we also have to be realistic um in understanding india's intentions they're not just charitable but you know they also want to expand their influence in sri lanka they you know they have economic interest in sri lanka i'm sure they'd like to get uh, certain development contracts and um you know th th they would consider sri lanka their backyard right so that's basically what they're trying to do and it's a golden opportunity for them um if sri lanka is in a position to push back a little to negotiate we can use it to our advantage of course um it is unfortunate that uh China seems to have withdrawn a little bit. Uh, of course the Chinese side have said that they're still, you know, going to help and they're just waiting to see what happens with the debt restructuring uh, renegotiating uh, process. Both is there anything you yeah. would like to I add? I think also we should, you know, like China is heavily invested in Sri Lanka as yeah. well. There's two ports that they have uh, exactly. the port city they all have a stake in that and a lot of their companies are invested here. True. So I don't think they'll just, you know, let their companies hang Yeah, you know, let them hang. I mean, there's there's over three billion dollars in investment in Chinese so investments in Sri Lanka, so I don't think they're they're going to abandon that. Yeah, that's yeah. Sri Lanka recovering is good for their businesses here as well. So that's very right. true. Yeah. Now, resorting to the IMF, I feel it should have been the last resort. Uh, do you think that going to the IMF and getting their help, do you think it will uh, stabilize the economy in some way? Hmm. the benefits yeah um so i personally don't think it will stabilize the economy depending on what your definition of stabilize is right so if you come at it at a very sort of neoclassical 
economist point of view and you're, you're, you know, you're just looking at the budget deficit or whatever and you're, you're targeting um, you know, numbers on a sheet, uh, you know, perhaps that could happen. But um, I think socially the impact on people's lives from the IMF program is going to be very difficult. And we're seeing it already, right? So you know, they have to liberalize the exchange rate. They have to let it float. Um, you know, that's going to lead to depreciation of the rupee, which is going to lead to imported inflation, right? Because we import a lot of uh, goods in dollars. So we're already seeing that. Um, then there's going to be pressure to remove certain subsidies, uh, subsidies on fuel, on agriculture. And again, that's going to uh, hit the production economy really hard. A lot of companies are uh, suffering and having a very hard time right now. Um, so I wouldn't call any of that stability, right? I think it's disingenuous to say that the IMF is going to bring uh, stability. It's, it's basically like bad medicine that you're forced to swallow because, uh, you know, uh, that's just what basically what the IMF cocktail is. Um, I don't expect stability. In, in fact, I think as we go forward and we start to implement more and more, uh, you know, now the cost structure has already gone up with inflation and with depreciation. It'll go up again once taxes kick in, once we have indirect taxes, once and once we have corporate taxes. Um, and again, it's going, to, it's going to be genuinely destabilizing, socially destabilizing. And we, we've seen the kinds of protests um, that came about. And they came about immediately after we started implementing the IMF re reforms. Now, this isn't to say that we shouldn't do some of it. Like, there are certain things that, of course, we'd have to do. So we have to raise a certain amount of tax revenue. Um, but doing it in a very sort of ad hoc, non-strategic, non-planned way can be very disruptive. Uh, Right. Do you think by any way, if we get through to the IMF, what are the benefits that our country can obtain from this? I would, in a benefit, I think I would look at it again back to a, like a dollar cash flow perspective. We would definitely be good to have more dollars coming in. But then again, the IMF doesn't give that a bulk, maybe three to four billion at once. They would like spread it out. So it will be a, a small cushion, but not really what we need right now. Uh, and maybe again to the debt restructuring part, That's having yeah. the IMF on the table with you while you uh, talk to the Paris Club or the bilateral partners will definitely help. There's no doubt about that because they, yeah. they already know that and the IMF staff have probably been through many mm -hmm. more debt restructures than any of our party members sure. would have gone through. So that will definitely be a big positive. And there's also probably the uh, access to ISBs, right? Yeah. Uh, since being in an IMF program might help improve Sri Lanka's uh, credit rating, which in turn might give us better access to uh, issue sovereign bonds and, and get uh, more loans, which in the short term can be beneficial, but you know, in the long term, structurally not a very good idea. Now coming back to the fuel crisis we are experiencing here, we have experiencing a shortage of crude oil and refined oil, uh, diesel, petrol, everything. and. Currently, there's a war going on between Russia and Ukraine as well. Do you think the war which is currently going on is affecting our economic crisis here? Do you think it's falling here? What are the impacts uh, that we have with the war there? Um, I think it certainly is impacting, uh, particularly on the price of energy, right? So um, as soon as the... Um, so uh, anyway, uh, energy prices, the, the price of uh, crude oil was on the rise, but you know, as soon as the uh, uh, Russian incursion into Ukraine happened, the prices uh, shot up and they have stayed high since. Um, so in a situation where we don't have dollars and we don't have fuel, we're seeing uh, global oil prices go up like daily, basically, which is extremely destructive, right? Um, I used the term, term perfect storm before, like this is literally a perfect storm, like it's the worst time it could happen for a country like Sri Lanka of any debt distressed uh, developing country. Uh, so that's a significant uh, impact. Both, what do you have to yeah, say? I think there's more. I think we also import uh, wheat from them, mm. and wheat is a stable uh, uh, food for us. So that has also hiked, and the mm. whole uh, the fuel prices going up in ra the world mm. is putting up the global inflation up, which is then again affecting yeah. all our imports. So even though our volume of import would have dropped. Our import bill is still bill high. Is still increasing. Just because of the global inflation. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, a non-economic factor is, is the geopolitics of it, right? So 
uh, Sri Lanka was already in sort of a difficult geopolitical situation that we've not been able to adequately um, manage our relations with uh, India, China, and, and the US, and those were just three players. So now you add uh, Russia into the mix, and uh, un unfortunately our foreign policy has been very weak in managing our own self-interest in the middle of all these uh, major power rivalries. <laughs> All right, to continue our discussion, uh, we have more to talk on. We have one more segment to go, but before that, let's go into a short commercial break. You're watching Gen XYZ. Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we are in discussion with Shiran and both about the economic crisis and in the first and second segment we touched up a lot about the current situation of our country and we spoke about the shortages of supply and also about the critical situation of we depleting our foreign reserves as well. Uh, something which I want to ask you all again is that recently um, the government decided to cut off tax during the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, now they have decided to come back into this tax scheme. And do you think it's the right decision for them to come back into direct taxes at this moment? Oh, do you want to take that? OK. So I think uh, it will, again, depend on what tax is increased. Right? If it's a tax that is uh, on reducing consumption of imports, that's a positive thing, because we want to reduce the amount of imports we take. But at the same time, looking at what we import, a lot of people, it will be a bigger portion of the poorer people's uh, consumption. Consumption basket, yeah. yeah. So that will affect them really bad. So their costs their cost will go higher than for everyone else. So we need to come with another solution to uh, subsidize their uh, cost of living. And another tax, you said direct taxes. So I think a wealth tax or even an income tax is a good thing to go for right now because when uh, there is a crisis there's always a case where the inequality increases so the rich they definitely get richer while the poorer just get crushed right so i think a wealth tax or even an income tax above a certain uh, income level is definitely a good thing and then again uh, i was having a debate with one of my friends saying at what point are you what annual income is considered makes you rich right is it one million a year or two million? So there'll be a debate on that, but definitely a higher income earner should pay their fair share of taxes, and that should be OK. And uh, while the tax cuts were given on a broad base scale in 2019, but that it was not really necessary to give it out to everyone, right? There's no need to give a handout to someone who already has a full plate. But mm -hmm. if it was done f more focused on the exports, you know, making sure we have more dollar inflows coming in to this IT sector. So those taxes should not be increased. So on those sectors, we should keep the tax cuts. But for the rest, I think it should be fairly OK now to increase taxes again. So you think the tax cuts which the government took to uh, take in 2019 was not a good decision? Well, I think it was it could have been better targeted if that was what they were going for, right? So the logic of a tax cut is that um, you know b basically there was a period of relatively higher taxation um, before the tax cuts, right? And um, this led to a diminishing of the profit margins of companies, and this would make them less inclined to make investments, right? So if there's no profit, no one. Uh, you know, no uh, private capitalist or businessman is going to invest their money into the economy if they don't have a profit. So the logic is that you you cut the taxes, th they make more profits, and then they're incentivized to invest. Now, the problem with a very broad macro um, intervention like that is that it's not targeted because we don't need investment in everything, right? We need to be very strategic and very specific on what kind of investment we want, what kind of economic activity we want to promote. We don't want to promote the same kinds of sort of uh, you know, import dependency or service-oriented uh, economic activity, right? So we want to promote manufacturing, we want to promote exports. So, you know, on that level, if we went, if the government at the time had gone into a more minute, um, you know, intervention, more, more surgically precise, I would say, 
uh, tax cut for you know strategic sectors, for uh, SMEs, for companies that were actually doing exciting things with potential to grow. I think that would have been better. But the way it was done was uh, sort of mishandled, I guess, in a way. And now there is no choice but to increase tax revenue uh, in this crisis, which is going to be a burden on everyone, really. But unfortunately, now there's no choice. Right. Now, I want to ask you a question about uh, on behalf of the citizens. Now, there are people who have been saving up some of their monies and the valuation of money is decreasing drastically. So what do you advise for a person who will say have been saving up 15 lakhs for the year and they have put up their fixed deposits somewhere? And what do you advise them to do with their money? Because obviously leaving them inside uh, the banks now is definitely no use they're not getting anything out of it, what would you advise them to do? I think uh, it's back again into the bank, but uh, right now the rates are, FD rates are really high, especially in finance companies. Yeah. So you probably would be able to get around 19 to 20%. And if you have put a FD last year, definitely pull it out and re-put it again with the higher rate. And also, I think it's best in this current situation to break it down into portions so that you, uh, if you really need some money in the short run, because you never know what could happen in the next few months. So like, be able to take out a portion while keeping the rest of your money in FDs and like break it down and manage your cash flows, know what, how much money you'll be spending for the next few months and then put your money in an investment. And also I think there are still some companies in the share market that you could look at, a very few, but there are, after the correction, there are some un companies that are undervalued, but don't go into anything without properly knowing what you're doing, and s definitely do not follow any stock market investment gurus <laughs> on where to put your money. Just do your own research and put it. Right, Shiran, what do you have to say on that? Um, yeah, I think adding to what both already said, um, you know, it really depends on the, the size of the, the volume of money that you have, right? Is it big enough to make an investment uh, in something? Uh, if it is, it might actually be worthwhile to sink some of that into uh, an, uh, some sort of fixed investment, right? As a, partially as a hedge against inflation, but also like a crisis is in a way a very good time to, uh, to start a business for a young business, right? Like um, a lot of um, SMEs that I speak to, of course, they have significant problems, but they're also optimistic because there are opportunities. Like when there are problems, problems need solutions, and solutions come in the form of business models. Um, I mean, I can think of, say, uh, something like uh, solar power is something that you know, everyone is looking into now. Uh, it can be a personal investment just for your home. I mean, if you, again, if you have the volume of capital required for that. Uh, another thing is uh, agriculture. I mean, if you're going into a food crisis and food prices are going up, then it absolutely makes sense to invest in something agricultural to make some sort of value-added agricultural product and sell it. Um, so, yeah, if you have the right volume of capital, it might be better to invest it now than to keep it and let it get deteriorated through inflation. Do you think it's a good idea for them to invest it on a plot of land or gold at this point? A plot of mm. land, I think... Uh, the rate that you could get from the bank is uh, definitely higher than what you could get on a rent income or even uh, so someone would invest in land or in property because they could get that you know, rent income as well as the value of uh, the property will increase. But in a high interest rate environment like this, there is going to be less and less demand for uh, properties, so the prices are going to go down, so you might not get the normal rate of return from a property investment that then you would normally, would have got the last few years. So I don't think putting it into land is the best thing. And on gold, gold also has the same uh, case. It might be a hedge. It was a good hedge for anyone who had bought gold before the depreciation. It was definitely probably mm -hmm. the best hedge for the depreciation that happened. But right now, I think uh, gold prices are also going down globally. I think the gold price is going down. So it might not be the best hedge. Yeah. Again, it depends on how, I think, long term your horizon yeah. is. So gold, as you said, the prices have gone down. But if you're looking very long term, if you're looking in terms of, say, the next business cycle, then it makes sense. Because right now, the, the US Federal Reserve is raising the interest rates. So the value of the dollar is going up against 
gold, right? And gold prices have gone down. So you could buy into gold now while it's uh, somewhat cheap because eventually as the business cycle progresses, the Fed will reduce their interest rates eventually, a couple of years down the line, and at that point gold will pick up. But, you know, we're talking about at least 10, 20 years in the future. <laughs> right. We are coming to the end of our segment as well. As my last question, uh, what do you think, like how f drastically low has the economic crisis has come into compared to the year 2090, just before the pandemic? And how long do you think that we will be able to take in order to recover or come into a stabilized situation? And, um, yeah. How long do you think it will take to come back into normal? Mm. I think that's the question that everyone yeah. wants to answer, to know the answer to. If I had the answer to that, I'd have like a million dollars and <laughs> probably won't have to come on TV into you. But, uh, you know, I think we're not fortune tellers, so it's impossible to say. I think it depends a lot on, as we hinted on earlier, how we use this crisis to address the current issues, right? Um, because, we can come out of it. It's you know it's, we don't want to be all doom and gloom. Like there is a path out of it. Uh, countries have been in worse situations before, and they've come out of it. Um, they've you know produced their way out of it. They've industrialized. They've had the right policies. Um, I think it is possible for Sri Lanka to come out of it. I wouldn't put a, a, a time frame on it because a lot depends also on the global situation. So if the entire global economy is on a downturn, and we don't know how long that'll last, it could be. You know, three to four years could be longer. It's it's impossible to say, but uh, I think all Sri Lankans should keep in mind that like it doesn't have to be doom and gloom. That it is possible to come out of it. Countries have done it before, and we can do it too. Um, but there needs to be a level of I think consensus yeah. and unity on what is needed to make that happen. What do you think as citizens that can be done in order to you know somehow come out of this situation? What should the people do right now? I think the people should uh, know uh, and know what is happening in the economy and what the solutions are and kind of align towards one set of solutions. So right now we should keep an eye on what's happening with the debt restructure and what we want from it, as in what everyone would want from it, as well as the IMF program to make sure that the, the IMF program will definitely help the debt restructuring. But we should also keep in mind that we have been in 16 IMF programs. So we, we now we are going, going for the 17th. We don't want to be on the 18th, right? So maybe all the past IMF programs wasn't exactly what we needed. So we should make sure that what we do what's best for Sri Lanka, the policies that we want from the IMF or what we are going to give out to the IMF, saying these are our policy prescriptions yeah. to sta stabilize the economy, are what's best for Sri Lanka in the long run. So and the people must all rally around it. I think that will give the international community a good idea that, OK, Sri Lanka, the, both the private sector, the public sector, are backing this specific plan. So if investment is going to come, we are not going to go on the roads and say we don't want it. We are not going like we have to be OK. And there has to be a consensus around what we are going to do. Or otherwise, we are going to go back into crash mode. Right? So everyone should know what's happening. And I think the, the government should also put out what's happening with a lot of clarity so that everyone is on the same page about where we are going going to be headed in the next Transparency year. Transparency yeah. must be there. All yeah. right, so we've come to the end of our uh, segment as well. And on our show, again, Shiran and Bodh, thank you very much for taking the time to join me on Gen XYZ. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to talk about this topic again because I don't feel that this topic is going to die out anytime soon. Again, thank you very much for giving your inputs on this economic crisis of Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you. And that was the end of our episode on Gen XYZ. We will be back again next week with another contemporary topic or issue that affects the youth as well. And just in case you can watch us on air, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. Till then, stay safe and have a good night. I'm Suzanne Shinali. <laughs>